All right, so the biggest question that investors have in today's market is are we in a stock market bubble? Now that is the question I've been trying to find the answer to for the last two weeks. And the way I've been going about it is by researching past stock market manias that have led to stock market collapses in order to extract out some commonalities across all of those stories to assess whether we are in a stock market bubble today. So in this video, I'm gonna be covering three past stock market manias. The first is gonna be the 1720s South Sea Scheme, which led to a huge boom and bust in England's economy in the 1720s. The railway mania that happened in England in 1845 and the 1929 Great Depression. I'm gonna be laying out the story for all of these market manias and I'm gonna be extracting out of each of them some commonalities that we can use to identify what it means to be in a stock market bubble. Now, I got most of my information from this book right here that will take the hindmost. So if any of you are interested in learning more about stock market speculation and how this leads to bubbles, you should absolutely read this book. You can find the link to it in the description down below. And now if you wanna skip ahead to any market bubbles that you might be more interested in, you can find the timestamp for each section in the description down below. So with that, let's get started. All right, so let's get started with the first bubble we're gonna be talking about, and that is the South Sea Bubble of 1720. Now, I thought that this bubble was the most interesting out of all the bubbles I learned about, and the reason why is because it carries the same characteristics as the rest of the bubbles we're gonna be talking about, but it happened in just nine months. This is compared to the other bubbles that took multiple years, some even longer than a decade, to form and finally collapse, whereas the South Sea Bubble took just nine months to create a massive boom and bust in the English economy. Now, the reasons why this happened are very interesting, but before we get into that, first I'm gonna just provide a quick background on the state of the English economy at the time, as well as a brief introduction to what the South Sea Company was prior to them creating a monstrosity that led to one of the fastest boom and bust cycles in history. So prior to the South Sea Bubble of 1720, England and France had just finished a long war. And in the years of peace following the war, the English economy was prospering. Interest rates were at an all-time low, and the King of England had issued a statement saying that he believed that the economy was going to prosper and flourish in the coming years. So there's a lot of optimism present in the market at this time. Now, the South Sea Company was formed in the year 1711 as a trading company. They had taken over some of the government's debt and converted it into shares in the company. And for this, they were given a monopoly on trade with Spanish colonies in South America, in which they primarily dealt in the trade of slaves. However, the company produced consistent losses in their trading business, so they did not succeed as a trading company, but since they had taken over the government debt at their inception, they had succeeded in becoming a financial institution. So the South Sea Company wanted to take this even further in the year 1720 by taking over all of the British government's debt and converting it into shares in the company. This is what led to the South Sea Scheme of 1720, and it is the terms of this scheme that are very important to understand because this is what led to the massive boom and bust that lasted just nine months. So here are the terms of the deal. The British government had 30 million pounds of debt outstanding. They were going to allow the South Sea Company to convert that debt into shares in the company in which the company would then take the interest payments from the British government and pay their shareholders a dividend. Now, as part of this deal, the government had negotiated with the South Sea Company that they would be reducing the interest payment on their debt as soon as the company took over the debt. Now, this already produced favorable terms for the British government. However, on top of these already favorable conditions, the British government wanted the South Sea Company to pay the British government a 7.5 million pound kicker for the privilege of taking over the British government's debt. Clearly, this was some sort of bribe to allow the South Sea Company to take over the debt in the first place, as the British government was already receiving favorable terms from this deal. So this additional 7.5 million pounds was clearly going to be going to pay off somebody to allow this deal to happen in the first place. So that is the first red flag of this scheme. The second is the more important red flag because this was the fatal flaw that allowed this South Sea bubble to occur in the first place and is what led to the massive boom and bust in the English economy. And that was the introduction of a cyclical element to the pricing of the shares of South Sea stock. So the British government was going to allow the South Sea Company to issue 315,000 shares at a par value of 100 British pounds. This allowed them to issue 31.5 million pounds worth of South Sea Company shares in order to convert that 30 million pounds of British government debt. However, this didn't give them the additional money to pay off that 7.5 million pound kicker. So this means that the South Sea Company was going to have to issue the shares at a premium in order to generate that additional cash to pay off this bribe that they were going to be paying to the British government. So the South Sea Company realized 
if they were able to sell their shares at a premium to the current debt holders, they would then be able to reserve a number of shares that they could then further sell to the market at an even higher premium to generate profits for the company, thus warranting an even higher share price. And when the share price goes up, that means that the company can issue more shares for a profit, so the value of the company goes up, and so on and so forth. And this created a cyclical element to the pricing of South Sea Company shares, which is what led to the ultimate boom and bust in the British economy. Now, in addition to this, the South Sea Company was giving away shares for free to royalty and other public figures in order to generate a lot of interest from the public. So in addition to the bribe that the British government was taking from the South Sea Company, they had introduced an element of cyclicality, which is a fatal flaw in most economic bubbles. In addition to that, they were also giving out shares for free in order to generate interest from the public, which is clearly a corrupt act. So there were a lot of problems with the South Sea scheme right from the beginning but that didn't stop this bubble from forming. Now, this deal was proposed to Parliament on January 21st, and by February, the company's stock had already risen from 128 pounds per share to 187, and by April, the stock price was trading at above 300 pounds per share. And it was in April that the company offered the first share subscription to the public, followed up later in the same month by the second share subscription. Now, since the company's stock was trading at such a large premium, the company had been left with 185,000 shares that they were able to sell to the public for pretty much just pure profit. This meant that the higher that the share price rose, the more profits that the company could make, which is what led to a massive speculative bubble starting in the month of May and peaking in the month of July at just under £1,000 per share. Now, there were some other elements that fueled this boom, and part of that was credit creation. Much like a bank creates money by giving out loans to its customers, the South Sea Company was creating money by giving out loans to people who wanted to buy their stock. So if somebody wanted to buy a share of the South Sea Company, they only had to put up 20% of the share's value, and the South Sea Company would provide you a loan worth 80% of the share price, and you would have to pay back that loan over 8 installments over the next 16 months. So not only had the South Sea Company introduced an element of cyclicality in the pricing of their shares, they were also creating money so that people could buy more shares of South Sea stock. This is a double whammy for creating a speculative environment, and this is a great example of what happens in other bubbles, except in other bubbles it happens in a longer time frame. However, with the South Sea Company, it happened in just a couple of months. Now, what's actually interesting is that most people knew that the South Sea Company's share price was overvalued. What they were trying to do was to make gains at the expense of greater fools. However, what they didn't realize is that by participating in the bubble, it was them themselves that were the greater fools. And what's interesting is that no matter how smart or wealthy you were during this time, if you partook in the bubble, most likely you lost money. And even Sir Isaac Newton, who is a genius, lost all of his money in the South Sea bubble. He had bought in early in the year and ended up selling around April or May, but he ended up seeing a lot of his friends making a bunch of money later on in the year. So he ended up buying back into the bubble at the very peak of the bubble, and he lost all of his money within a few months. And this led to one of his famous quotes, which was, I can predict the motion of the heavenly bodies, but not the madness of people. So no matter if you were a smart, wealthy, a commoner, a politician, if you partook in this bubble, you probably ended up losing money. And that's a good lesson for all of us to be aware of if we ever see something that approximates what we believe is a bubble. Now, after the massive success of the South Sea scheme, a lot of smaller companies began to form and issue shares to the market since they wanted to also benefit off of this massive boom and this massive boom in credit creation that the South Sea company was providing to investors in the market. During this period, 190 companies started offering shares to the market for a lot of speculative ventures like trading with Australia, which wasn't even a formed colony at the time, to countless numbers of brokerages that dealt primarily in the trade of South Sea Company shares. Now, of these 190 what are now known as bubble companies, only four of them ended up surviving after the South Sea bubble collapsed later on in the year. So that just shows you that one extremely successful speculation can just branch off into a bunch of smaller speculations and what is actually funny about this bubble is that the leader of the South Sea Company, John Blunt, is the guy who pricked the bubble and caused the eventual collapse of the stock market in Britain. Now, the reason that he did this was because he saw a lot of these bubble companies doing extremely well, 
And what he thought was that these bubble companies were taking away money that people could otherwise be spending on South Sea stock. But what he didn't realize is that people were funding these bubble companies with profits that they were making from their shares in South Sea Company. So what John Blunt did, who at this point was a messianic figure, and that is something that is common in bubbles, is that the crowd usually looks for one guy or girl that's going to be leading them or guiding them in some way on how to navigate the bubble. And that is the role that John Blunt had. He was a messianic figure at this time, and everybody put a lot of weight on what he said. But what he did was he got very jealous of seeing all these bubble companies doing really well, so he leveraged his political influence to get the Attorney General to prosecute three bubble companies and introduce what was called the Bubble Act. Now, this had the opposite effect of what John Blunt thought was going to happen, and it actually sparked a massive panic and sell-off in all the bubble companies. And now, since everybody was losing money in the bubble companies, they had to fund those losses from their profits in the South Sea Company. So everybody started selling shares in the South Sea Company as well, and this is what popped the South Sea Bubble. In a matter of four weeks, South Sea stock had fallen 75%, and by the year 1721, this company's stock was trading below par value in the 90 pound range. This happened even though the company tried to raise their dividend to 50% to try to excite investors to want to buy the stock again, but nothing really happened as the fear in the market outweighed the greed and eventually it led to the market collapse. So that is the South Sea bubble. And now let's move on to the railway mania that took place also in England in 1845. All right, so the railway mania took place in 1845 and ended in Britain's economic collapse in 1847. Now, railways were first introduced to England in 1825. However, they faced a lot of public opposition until 1942 because a lot of people thought that the pollution that they would cause would end up killing livestock and blackening the skies. After a while, they realized that this wasn't the case and the public perception of railways changed in 1842 after Queen Victoria took her first ever train ride. After this, the public was much more accepting of railways, and this was the beginning of what led to the railway mania, which began with the Railway Act of 1844. Now before we get into what was in that act, first I'm going to introduce the messianic figure of this story, who was George Hudson. George Hudson was known as the Railway King of England, and he came from very humble beginnings, but eventually he built up a railway empire, and in 1844, he was known as the father of railways as he had 1,000 miles of railway in England, which represented around one-third of the total railway miles. Now, he used a lot of pretty nasty cost-cutting measures in order to boost the profitability of his company and be able to acquire a lot of other railways at a price that other competitors wouldn't be able to pay. One example of his very nasty cost-cutting measures was that he hired a very old train conductor in order to run one of his railway lines. This train conductor had very poor eyesight, but George Hudson was able to pay him a very low wage. And eventually what this led to was a fatal incident on that railway. So this is an example of some of the cost-cutting measures that George Hudson was willing to employ. And it also just speaks to his character as he was very self-interested and he was willing to do whatever it took to fatten his own pockets. So now that we know about George Hudson, who is a central figure to the story, let's move on to the Railway Act of 1844. Now, Railway Act of 1844 lowered the barrier to entry for people who were looking to start new railway companies. And also what it did was it laid the groundwork for what allowed the railway mania to occur in the first place. The requirements for starting a new railway were as follows. First, you would need a group of dignitaries to form a committee and register the company provisionally. These people were later known as provisional committee men and were also the promoters of the stock that they were selling. After they formed this committee, they would be able to go raise money from the public by selling script, which is just another word for stock. And then they would have to employ an engineer to go survey the route that they were looking to build the railway on. After this, they would apply for a railway bill from the regulatory body. Now, after all these conditions were met, the script was then able to trade publicly on the market. But a very important feature about the script was that you only had to put up 10% of the value of the script as your initial investment. The other 90% would be callable upon the beginning of construction of that railway. So if you wanted to invest in these railways, you didn't have to put up the entire amount, just 10% until the railway construction actually began. So this introduced a lot of speculation because people didn't have to pay the full amount of the shares right up front. But this also led to a lot of credit creation and unsustainable credit creation because a lot of projects that likely weren't even going to end up happening started getting funded by the public. Now, some of the members in Parliament saw this as a problem, but George Hudson leveraged his political influence in order to shout down anybody who thought that this bill was not a good thing for the English economy, and eventually this bill was passed in 1844. Now, the mania actually started taking place in 1845. 
Before that, the English economy is doing very well. The country had experienced very good harvests and good profits from trade. So there was a lot of optimism and people believed that the English economy was going to continue doing well in the future. Now in January of 1845, there was projected that 16 new railway lines would be launched in that year. However, by April, there had been 50 new railway lines already registered. There was advertisements all over the place, in the newspaper, in the windows of shops. So the public was getting very excited. And on top of that, provisional committee men were giving shares out for free to a lot of public figures in order to get the general public excited and wanting to invest in these new railway companies. Now, during this time, there was also a lot of corruption because a lot of the committee men would only issue a small number of shares onto the market in order to scare off any short sellers. And then once the demand built up for the stock and the stock price started rising and the public got excited and wanted to buy into that railway line, the committee men would dump all of their shares for a massive profit on the unsuspecting public. And essentially what they were doing was just pump and dump schemes. And they ended up making themselves very rich through this and dumping a bunch of otherwise worthless shares on the public. And what's also interesting about this bubble was that similar to the 1720s South Sea scheme, a lot of the people who were investing and trading these scripts were also aware of the fact that they were trading overvalued securities. But what they wanted to do was take advantage of greater fools and profit off of the fact that other people wanted to pile into the stock. And something that highlights just how irrationally exuberant the market was at this time was that there would be 9 to 10 railway proposals for the exact same line and the stock for every single one of those railways would be trading at a premium. Now, obviously that doesn't make sense because only one of those railway companies are gonna succeed and be allowed to develop their railway line on there, but the market was pricing all of them as if they had already won. So clearly there was a lot of irrational exuberance in the market at this time, and the irrationality was really starting to peak around late summer of 1845. During this time, some of the railway stocks were showing profit of 500% and the interest on loans for buying the stock were as high as 80%. But the market didn't really care at this time because everybody was making money hand over fist. But by the end of the summer, a lot of fraud started to become apparent in the public as a lot of parliament members were exposed as having taken bribes from some of these railway companies or having actually participated in the pump and dump schemes themselves. Now, this led to quite a large panic in the market and a lot of people started to sell off their railway script. However, some people were met by markets that were not willing to buy the stock at all and they were essentially just stuck with this stock that they also had to pay the remaining 90% on once the project got underway. And the committee men actually were made liable if the stockholders were not able to fund the development of the railway. So for this reason, the committee men almost became kind of like gangsters and they forced people who were holding the stock to pay up if the railway got approved and they had to begin construction. Now, this led a lot of people to declaring that they cannot pay that 90%, which led to the Dissolution Act in 1846. And now what the Dissolution Act did is that if 75% of the shareholders of any one railway line agree that they would prefer to just dissolve the railway and leave with whatever losses they have instead of having to continue fund that railway, then that railway could just dissolve and cease to exist. And this happened to a number of them, but there were still a very large number of railway lines that were going to continue the development of the railway line. So this led a lot of money in 1846 to be diverted away from things like sports or paying for things like wine and servants and had to be diverted towards the funding of building these railway lines. Now in 1846, England had a very bad harvest, which ended up leading to an economic crisis in 1847. And this was the end result of all the speculation that happened in England during the railway mania as a lot of money was diverted away from the most efficient allocation of resources and all of it was being funneled towards building out these railways. So the economy didn't have very much money to be able to spend on fixing other problems that were attributed to the poor harvest. So this led to an economic crisis in 1847. And if you want to know what happened to George Hudson, he ended up becoming a belligerent drunk and eventually he ended up dying in 1859 with a net worth of just 200 pounds a lot smaller than the multi-million dollar net worth that he had during the boom of the railway mania. So that was a railway mania. Now let's move into the final bubble we're going to be talking about, which is the Great Depression of 1929. All right, so the Great Depression, since it was only around 90 years ago, still happens to be one of the most commonly cited economic events for investors today. And for that reason, a lot of investors know a little bit more about the Great Depression than they do the other speculative bubbles that we talked about in this video. But I'm going to talk about the key factors that led to the massive boom and bust in the U.S. economy during the 1920s. And now this is primarily due to two primary innovations. 
The first was the creation of the Federal Reserve in 1913 that led a lot of investors and academics to believing that past market panics and market cyclicality were going to be completely abolished from the equity market system. And the second was the Industrial Revolution, which greatly improved the quality of earnings for a lot of companies as they became more predictable. Now, these two factors combined to making investors believe that the removal of panics from the market, as well as the improved quality of earnings for companies, should be reflected in the equity market through higher valuations. Now, prior to this period, most investors didn't look at equities as a long-term investment. They looked at them more as a speculation. At this time, a lot of investors believed that bonds were true investment and equities were just speculative instruments. But Ben Graham and Edgar Lawrence Smith came along and changed the public's perception of using equities as long-term investments. Through statistical analysis, Edgar Lawrence Smith proved in his little book called Common Stocks as Long-Term Investments that equity instruments provide better returns over the long run because of the compounding effect of retained earnings. Ben Graham was more focused on valuation, as many of you probably know, but he was also aware of the fact that you can use valuation to create speculative bubbles and he was quoted as saying, calculus gives speculation the deceptive guise of investment. And what he means is that you can use mathematical models to predict the future earnings of a company, but those future earnings are dependent purely on what your inputs are. So you can manipulate those numbers as much as you want to justify any share price for a company. And this is similar to what happened during this period, as a lot of people use these mathematical models to come up with predictions for what future stock prices might be worth. So these are a few important factors that you need to note that led to the excessive speculation that occurred in the 1920s. Now, in addition to this, what became very common during this period was that companies would provide customers with installment loans, which essentially acted as credit. So a lot of companies were able to boost their sales by providing their customers with credit. And it was estimated that around one eighth of all purchases during the 1920s were made on credit. Now, the belief during this time was that customers would be able to make purchases on credit and this would increase the profitabilities of companies, thereby increasing the wages of Americans. And this prosperity would then transfer down into the customers being able to pay back their installment loans. However, they wouldn't realize till a little bit later that they got a little bit excessive with their loan giving. And this led to a credit crunch later on in the late 1920s. And in addition to credit being given out to customers, companies were also giving out loans to shareholders. What companies would do during this period is they would raise money through the stock market and any excess capital that they raised from the stock market, they would loan out to shareholders through the call loan market. And the call loan market was essentially just a marketplace for where people could borrow money to buy stock. So the companies were raising money from the equity market in order to loan it back out to the equity market. So this led to a massive credit creation phase and it was fueled also by the belief that market panics were eliminated and that the quality of companies' earnings warranted excessively high valuations. So these combinations were all fueling the bubble that grew in the 1920s, and it took about a decade for this bubble to form. So it didn't happen overnight like the 1720s South Sea bubble or happen in two, three years like the railway mania did. It took around a decade for this bubble to fully form and collapse. But during that time, the public's access to the stock market was increasing at a very rapid pace. From 1928 to 1929, the number of brokerage houses increased by 80%, with 600 new brokerage houses being introduced just in that year alone. Now, as we said, there is generally a central figure to these stories where the general public is able to rally around. And in this case, that was Charles Mitchell, who was a corrupt commercial banker. Now, at this time, commercial banks weren't allowed to deal in securities. They weren't allowed to sell securities to their clients. So what Charles Mitchell did is that he invested in a bunch of subsidiaries that were the ones that were dealing in the stock. And what he would do is he would peddle second rate securities to the general public. And actually the peddling of second rate securities to the general public became known as Mitchellism. And eventually he ended up betting all of his money on the market in the late cycle of the market bubble. And he ended up losing all of his money, which is pretty fitting for a guy who's doing what he was doing. But now on top of messianic figures like Charles Mitchell, the market was also being fueled by a lot of speculation from the billionaires of that time. And during that period, a lot of the billionaires were people who started automotive companies like the founder of GM or the Chrysler. And what these investors would do is they would form small pools of investors and they would essentially manipulate the stock price to increase their gains. So clearly there was a lot of fraud and corruption going on during this period. And that is what fueled a lot of the speculation in the market because the public was seeing a lot of these billionaires making a lot of money in the market. So they also wanted to participate in the market and make money just like them. And now a lot of this prosperous growth was also fueled by new innovations like the car that was replacing railways and also the radio that was transforming the way that humans were able to communicate. 
So there were a lot of actually really important innovations that came during this period, but all that they did was serve to fuel the bubble that continued to grow into the late 1920s. Now during this time, investment trusts, which you can think of similar to mutual funds today, became very, very popular. And they started managing very large sums of money. And a lot of investment speculators at the time believed that investment trusts would end up making the markets more efficient, but they actually ended up fueling the speculation. The reason why is because they would invest heavily into blue chip stocks and that would lead to an increase in the price of blue chip stocks and they would invest the remainder of their money into the call loan market which was just fueling speculation for the general public. So they were buying blue chip stocks, driving the stock price up and then they were loaning out their money to the call loan market which was being used to further invest into those blue chip stocks. So it created this kind of cycle of a lot of people buying blue chip stocks and increasing the valuation of a lot of the stocks in the market at that time. By the time the market was peaking, a lot of stocks were trading at price to earnings ratios well above 100 and this became common as a lot of companies had price to earnings ratios in the high 10s or low 100s and this was just what was believed was going to be the new norm for the stock market which sounds a little bit scarily similar to what is going on in today's market, but we're going to get into that at the end where we extract the commonalities from these three stories and try to apply them to the market today. Now, as the market approached its peak in 1929, there wasn't necessarily a specific event that pricked the bubble and led to a massive panic. It was more so that investors started to become a little bit more receptive to negative information. There's a lot of academics coming out stating that the market had peaked and was now set to fall dramatically. GM had announced the end of the expansion as their car sales had experienced a dip in 1929. And this led a lot of investors to start get a little bit more worried. And eventually this led to a massive market panic and sell off in October of 1929. A lot of investors, as we said, were buying these stocks on margin through the call loan market. And when the market started to dip down, they had to cover any of those losses by selling their stock. And this just led to a chain reaction of people having to sell as a lot of the market was over leveraged. This is essentially what happened as the call loan market maxed out the credit potential of the market and eventually the liquidity crisis hit and everybody had to sell off their shares or whatever assets that they had in order to meet their margin calls. So that is what caused and popped the 1929 stock market bubble. So now let's try to extract the commonalities from all three of these stories that we talked about so that we can see some of the common elements that are present in market bubbles and market manias and try to apply that to the stock market today and see if we are potentially in a stock market bubble. So after reading the book, The Devil Takes a Hindmost, which goes over eight market manias, I was able to extract seven commonalities across all of the stories that were able to represent exactly what happens during these bubble phases so that we can try to apply what we learned from those bubbles to today's markets. Now the first commonality across all of these stories was that there is some sort of new innovation that creates a new paradigm shift. And this is also a new innovation that generally will get the public very excited. During the South Sea bubble, that innovation was pretty much financial engineering with the South Sea company taking over the government's debts and basically creating a cyclicality in the pricing of their shares. In 1845, that new innovation was clearly the railroad, which was going to increase the productive capabilities of the country and also increase the speed of information travel. And in 1929, the innovation was the introduction of the Federal Reserve and also the Industrial Revolution, which improved the earnings qualities of a lot of companies. Now, the second commonality that I found across all of these stories is that there is a boom in credit creation. There is something within the economy that is creating a lot of credit and a lot of cheap credit so that people can take advantage of that cheap credit and start to speculate in the market. During the 1720s South Sea bubble, this credit creation phase was fueled by the South Sea company themselves as they were offering loans to purchase their stock. In 1845, this was caused by only having to put up 10% of the total value of shares when you originally invested in the new railway lines. And in 1929, the credit creation was coming from the companies itself who are providing credit to customers buying their products, as well as the call loan market, which was providing loans to investors to speculate in the stock market. Now the third commonality across all these is that there is generally a central figure that takes on a messianic role among the public and everybody puts a lot of weight into what they have to say and everybody just tries to follow along with what they do because during speculative manias everybody's pretty much lost and they're just looking for one guy or girl that they can just latch onto and do everything that they say. During the 1720 South Sea bubble that was John Blunt the leader of the South Sea company. During 1845 that was George Hudson. And during 1929, that was Charles Mitchell. Now the fourth commonality I found across all of them is that there is a lot of positive feedback from the market itself. 
Either this can be because of a cyclical element in the pricing of the stock or the asset that the bubble is occurring in, like happened in the South Sea bubble, or it can just be from a lot of speculation coming in from the market and a lot of public figures participating, or just seeing profits from your investments. Like in 1845, the railway stocks were rising up to 500%. Or in 1929, the stock market was rising three times faster than corporate earnings were rising. So there's a lot of positive feedback that creates euphoria in the market and everybody starts to want to participate. And a good way of identifying that this euphoric phase is happening is that stock prices are extremely high and are trading above what rational people would believe is fair valuation. The fifth is fraudulent activity. The market starts to notice a lot of fraudulent activity during the later phase of the boom as a lot of the insiders start to get caught for anything that they were doing wrong in the beginning. However, if you are really paying attention, you can notice the fraudulent activity at the beginning of the market. However, it becomes much more apparent towards the end of the market cycle. And a lot of the time it is this corruption or fraudulent activity that ends up popping the bubble or starts to signal the fact that the bubble is reaching its peak. Now, the sixth element that I found is that there is a liquidity crunch. A lot of people have been taking out loans or are trading on margin. And when the market starts to dip down, a lot of people are getting margin calls and they have to start paying back the loans that they took out in order to fuel this growth in the stock market or whatever asset class the bubble is occurring in. This was clearly evident in all three of the cases that we talked about. In the 1720s South Sea bubble, the market was being fueled by the loans given out by the South Sea company. In 1845, the fact that a lot of funds had to be directed away from things like sports activities or wine or servants and towards funding the development of these railway companies was evident that there was a liquidity crunch in the market. And in 1929, there was very clearly a liquidity crunch as consumers were taking out a lot of credit to buy things and investors were also taking advantage of the call loan market. Now the seventh and final commonality I found across all of these stories is that at the end of them, hope is absolutely lost. This isn't necessarily relevant to identifying or knowing how to combat a market mania, but it is kind of hopeful because people at that time have lost hope. They think that the system is completely broken and it's not going to make a comeback, but it always does. So when all hope is lost, that's probably the time that you should start investing or buying in whatever asset class it is that has experienced the bubble and has subsequently crashed. So now those are the seven commonalities that I found and let's apply the first four because we can only really apply the first four to today's market to see if we are indeed inside of a market bubble. Now the first element that we need is a new innovation and that new innovation comes in the forms of quantitative easing. Quantitative easing is a relatively new concept that was introduced by the Federal Reserve to combat the Great Recession that happened in 2008. Now essentially what quantitative easing is, is a Federal Reserve purchasing loans from the government and from other major banks in the United States. And effectively by doing this, they're lowering the cost of borrowing for these major banks and governments, thus allowing these major banks and governments to give out loans to the public for a very low cost. So they're increasing the availability of credit in the market through their quantitative easing. Now the second is that there's a boom in credit creation. And given that the innovation that the market is being fueled by today is the fact that there is a lot of credit being created there's very clearly a boom in credit creation interest rates are at an all-time low and borrowing is fairly easy for small businesses big businesses and consumers alike so there is a very large increase in credit and you can also see this by taking a look at the money supply which has increased extremely rapidly since the beginning of the covid 19 crisis now the third commonality that we can take a look at is that is there a central figure that is fueling the stock market and I don't think you have to think about it too hard. It's this guy. I mean, he talks about the stock market all the time. And I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but he has acted as a cheerleader for the stock market and has fueled a lot of optimism for people who are looking to invest in stocks. So he is sort of the central figure that we see today that is telling people to invest in the stock market and that the stock market's always making new highs. So that right now is the central figure that is leading the rise in the stock market's valuation. Now the fourth element is positive feedback and clearly we are seeing a lot of positive feedback from the market right now as the market has made an absolutely remarkable recovery and one that very few people actually predicted was going to end up happening as the S&P has broke out to make new highs, the Nasdaq has made new highs and the Dow Jones has been doing decently well considering what is going on in the market today. So there is a lot of positive feedback for investors and we're also seeing the valuation of stocks reaching new highs. Apple, for example, is trading around three standard deviations outside of what their average valuation has been in the past five years. So while this doesn't mean you should sell your Apple stock or that you should sell your stocks at all, 
What it does tell you is that the stock market is being valued fairly aggressively and it is a cause for concern and something that you should be taking a look at. Now we can also check that the stock market's valuation is high by using the CAPE ratio or the market cap to GDP. The CAPE ratio shows that the stock market is trading near the valuation that the stock market had during the period just before the Great Depression in 1929. But the market cap to GDP right now shows that the market is valued around 75% higher than the country's GDP. And just for reference, back in 2000, the market was valued at 34% higher than the GDP. And right before 2008, the market was valued around 1% to 2% higher than the value of GDP. So clearly the stock market is valued extremely optimistically. This doesn't mean that the stock market is going to crash, as we have not yet seen the fifth or sixth elements that are common across bubbles, which is a lot of fraudulent activity, as well as seeing some sort of a liquidity crunch. However, if you do notice that a lot of fraudulent activity starts to become common knowledge among the market, that does mean that it might be time to start reducing your exposure to equities. So that does it for this video. I hope you guys enjoyed. Um, this was a little bit more of a tougher video for me to film as it was very tricky to condense all the information that's in this book into a relatively short video. But I do hope that you guys learned something new and enjoyed this video. If you guys did enjoy this video, hit that like and subscribe button. If this video gets to 100 likes, then I'll do a video covering some of the other stock market bubbles that were in this book. And if you found this video interesting and you want to know more about the stock market bubbles and manias, then I suggest that you buy the book, The Devil Take the Hindmost. I think it's an absolutely incredible book. It has something like 450 citations in it. So the author did an incredible job. Uh, and you can find the link to the book in the description down below if you're interested. But other than that, I hope you guys enjoyed, and I'll see you in my next video. Have a great week.